That was Second Chronicles, not on your handout. First Chronicles. Made that mistake. Seen some perplexing looks. Psalms chapter thirty-four. Why do we struggle to pray? It is not a thing that we struggle, I think, to pray. I don't mean to be unkind or critical when I say that because I, too, struggle to pray. I have some tasks that I need to do or something's on my mind that's going to take me a day to get done and and I'm involved in what I'm doing and my mind gets into that groove and I get there and then suddenly I'm laying my head down on my pillow at night and I have this epiphany that I... I never prayed all day. And not only that, I I never even thought about praying. And I have to tell you, I feel terrible when that happens. To go all day and and not talk to God. Where where am I? What what life am I living to, to be able to do that? The life that I profess and yet go an entire day and not utter a prayer to God. Who am I? Am I really a follower of God, of Christ? Am I setting the proper example with my family? I feel bad and regretful when that happens. Now, I talk to a lot of people, and from time to time I talk to other preachers, other disciples, and it's, I don't want to say it's okay, but it's not an unusual day for that to happen. And that just, that struggle when it comes to prayer. And if we took a survey of this congregation, that's an idea. Took a survey from everybody and asked maybe everybody, what would you like to be focused in on maybe for a year or it's worth of teaching or six months? Or what are you struggling with? Top ten, top five. I promise you that probably one or, one or at least two would be our prayer life. That we would want to focus on our prayer life. And, and, and so... It seems that the problem is not an uncommon one. So I would say to you again that because so many of us struggle, though, it doesn't make it any, uh, I don't know, less odd. Think about it. The God in heaven said that you come to me, you pray to me, you communicate to me, you talk to me, and even sometimes when we don't have the words to say, that you think those words, that you address those words, and that he'll listen to what we have to say. That's the God we serve. Psalms chapter 34, verse 14. The psalmist says this. He says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those, he says, who are crushed in spirit. Think about what he tells us here. The eyes of the Lord are open to the righteous, to us, to those that serve him and cry to him. All I have to do is call out to the God in heaven, and he'll hear my prayers and I'll listen to you. Now the amazing thing though, that he just doesn't listen to us, but verse 17 says, do you see it there? He'll deliver them. He'll hear you. He'll deliver you. God not only promises, listen, if you want to talk to me, I'll listen to you. And not only will I listen to you, I'm going to help you. I'll help you with whatever problem that you have. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to serve as your father. You need to talk to me. You need to communicate with me with whatever trouble you're having with. Prayer is a way to access that power of God. Prayer is a way to access the work of God for you. And really the Bible promises that he will hear. The Bible promises that he will help. And isn't it odd though? that we struggle to pray. And you would think that this would be a habit that all of us as Christians would embrace and engulf and and practice every day. And then we look at it, and, and instead of counting it as a wonderful blessing, it's almost like a curse, this prayer life that we're supposed to have, because it's just another reason to feel guilty. 
It's just another thing that I'm not doing that I'm supposed to do in my Christian life. Here it is. I've went all day and I feel guilty for not playing and, and I'm frustrated by that. If you think it's frustrating for you or us, I want you to think for a moment how the Creator might feel. I've opened the windows of heaven so that you can communicate with me and pray to me. And I'll hear you. I'll be there for you. This is what I've given you, this blessing. And He looks at us and we think of it as a curse. Think about how He must feel. Brethren, it all ought to be so. I think we need to answer the question, why? We struggle to pray. Let's think about that a minute. And I'll give you some answers that some people give me. Maybe we'll think about it. I think the first on the list that people would put is, why they struggle to pray? I'm too busy. Now that's the first thing that probably came to your mind when we're talking about praying and, and the amount of time that you have. You struggle to pray because, hey listen, we're too busy. We have busy lives. Listen, I got a job. And when I go to that job and come back to the job, then in the evening it's wide open. I can do what I want. No. There's always things to do when you come home in the evening. A ton of things to do when you come home in the evening. And then, you know what? The weekend comes up. You know, you got to shuttle the kids here and there, soccer here and there, grass, leaves, cars, trucks. You're busy, man. And then everything that you didn't get done those five days, here's the weekend. You're piling on over the weekend. And then the problem is that we're busy with all that stuff. And while we're doing all of that stuff, even when we're involved in the stuff, we're in the car and we got the iPod on. It's plugged in. And the what thing? You call it? What is that thing, Corey? I forgot. Anyway, it's plugged in. And when you're home, the TV's on. And then the game things are on the TV. And you're doing all that. You got fillers everywhere. And you've got to hook up to Facebook to see what your friends are having for supper. Take a picture of the food. Tell you what, we're busy. We're busy. So, but now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that all these things are inherently sinful. They're not. But I'll tell you what they are. They're distracting. And we are finding a way to fill every unfilled minute that we have in our life. And what those things do is they keep us from having the two things that are necessary for us to pray. And that is time and solitude. Time and solitude is what you need to approach God in prayer. Jesus understood that. And Jesus took the time to make sure that he did that. Look what he did in Luke chapter 5 and numerous other occasions. Verse 16 really is what he did. But the crowds were there, verse 15. All the healing that he was doing all the miracles, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. He did that a lot. He recognized the necessity of that because of his life. Now, I think one of the reasons that we do struggle to pray is because, you know what, we don't have those two things. We just press for time, and, and, and we don't have any solitude. There's no peace. But you know what? I'm the busiest guy in this room. I have the least amount of time of anybody in this room to pray. Now, you all see the faces, and people are stiffening up on me. We'd have a battle back and forth. I've got less time than you. You've got less time than me. Can any of us compare our life to the Lord's life? And when it comes to a busy life, I dare any one of you to say that your life is more busier than the Lord's. But yet, you know what he did? He carved out time. He carved it out and made sure that he found the place and the time to pray to his heavenly Father. Maybe sometimes, as we go through our average day, as busy as it is, and as busy as it seems, just so busy, but I wonder if we're really getting to the core of the problem when we're talking about prayer and time. Folks, things get busy. You know, we have that house down there in Wonderland, down there by the ocean. And you know, I, really, when we talk about it, and you guys mention it to us and stuff, and we make out like all we do down there, drink lemonade out of them little umbrella glasses, and have servants. We make out like it's just, you know, the great thing. I want to tell you something about that little yellow house. It is work. It's work. When I go down there, it's work. We work down there. That's our house. 
And it's work the whole time. And, and guess what? My, our lovely neighbor, Patty, she's not married. And next thing I know, I'm cutting Patty's trees. A lot of work. A lot of work down there. But you know, in all of that work and my busyness when I'm there, here comes the hurricane. 125 miles an hour right to my front door. It's going to hit right at my front door. Right there is where it's going to hit land. Jeff Dorton's front door. So I called Phil, my buddy. Uh, tw- been down there 25 years. Hey, you leaving the island? They kept going around, hey, evacuate, danger, warning, warning, death. All right? He said, I, I don't worry about it until it gets about 200. So I stayed. All right? But you know what? While we were getting ready for that thing, we were watching on TV coming straight to our little yellow house. And we had so many, you talk about busy. Packing up, bolting down, worrying about this, taking care of that. You know what we found time to do? Pray to God. Talk to God. Pray to God about our house, our lives, our family, our neighbors. Isn't it amazing? How in all of that, on top of what you had, we found time to pray. So when we say that we're too busy, I wonder sometimes if we get to the heart of the problem when we say we're too busy. Some people say, you know what, I struggle to pray because I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say to God. Now, I can understand a fellow, a new convert that has not had much of a prayer life, is not used to praying, and I'm not talking about just publicly, but privately also. Someone that was not raised in a house, that prayed. And maybe, probably the majority of folks here are like that. You might have heard some meaningless words uttered over some food every once in a while, but they really didn't mean much. And so I can understand someone that is not used to hearing prayer in the house or, or whatever. And when you start talking to a God that you can't see and a God that's not going to answer you audibly, that can be kind of awkward to, to, to talk to God, to say those things. And I think seasoned disciples find it difficult sometimes to pray. No matter how long you've been a Christian, we fall into that uh, trap, I think, just saying the same things over and over sometimes. We do that. I've caught myself doing that. Just praying for several minutes, you know, and, and I'm praying, and all of a sudden I think, what did I just say? Well, what did I just say? What did I just say to God? I didn't say anything, nothing but just old phrases that I've used in prayer over and over again. God, God doesn't want that. That's not what God wants. He wants you to talk to Him. He wants you to communicate to Him, to pray to Him, to open your heart and your mind and begin to talk to Him. It's not this, this list. We're going to check off and go down. I hope He's happy with that. I've said what they always say. That's what I hear in public. We pray the same way in private. It's just not the right lines. It's a real prayer to God. But I guess that can be awkward. And maybe it helps us to understand why when the disciples came to Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray, that you know what? There's something to say about prayer. It involves some mechanics. There's some structure to it. And, and what to say, and how to say it. And the Lord taught them to do that. You're not born with the innate ability to pray. You're just not. That's a learned thing, and we need to learn that. And sometimes, knowing what to say, I think it can be a problem. But yet when we say that, again, I wonder if we've got to the bottom of the problem why we struggle to pray, because we don't know what to say. I realize sometimes that we struggle for the right words. But you know what? There are times when we don't struggle at all. You're down at the office. You're down where you work, and here comes your boss. And he says, hey, guess what? I just got a call from corporate. We're going to, uh, 25% of the workforce is going to be hit the road Monday. We're all going to get pink slips. One out of four people that you see is going to lose their job. And, and you're, you're working from payday to payday. You got an electric bill due on this payday. And if you lose this job, you don't know the words to say, you're going to go home and say, I'd like to pray to God about this, but I can't find the words. I don't know exactly what to say. So is it really that we don't know what to say? 
or to something else. Sometimes people say they struggle to pray because they just feel unworthy. Unworthy to God to pray. I think it's an interesting one because, let's be clear, I want to tell you something. Not everyone, not everyone in this room has a right to call on God with an expectation for him to hear him and to respond to him. For some, you know what? That's a legitimate barrier. It really is. If I'm defying God's will for my life, if I've turned on him, and if I'm living a sinful life, and that's the decision that I've made, and I'm not going to obey God, I don't have a right to expect God to respond, and I don't have a right to expect God to hear my prayer. Now, I will tell you something. That's not a popular thing to say. The popular thing to say is God hears everybody all the time and responds just, that's the popular thing. But you know what? The problem with that is, that's not what the Bible says. When you look at uh, where we are at in Psalms 34, look again. The eyes of the Lord are open to whom? Who's the eyes of the Lord open to? The righteous. Who's his ears open to? Their Christ. The righteous Christ. Verse 16. The face of the Lord is against who? The evildoers. Now, would that imply that God does not hear the evildoer? I think so. There has to be things done before he will hear you. Before he'll respond to you. Now, if there's still some uncertainty about that, look at Psalm 66. Look at what he says, the psalmist in verse 16. He says this, Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord, he says, will not hear. Who are you serving? Think about that. There's uncertainty about it. Look at that. In Isaiah's day, the people in Isaiah's day, they thought the Lord just packed up and left. They didn't understand some things. They thought, they, they couldn't figure out why God wasn't helping them anymore. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah 59, verse 1. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short, that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. It not gotten to the point where God had grown old and hard of hearing. That's not what happened here. What happened here was verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. There's the separation because of sin. And your sins have hidden his face for, from you so that he does not hear. Yes, sir. I know it's not popular. But that's exactly what the Bible says. That is a real wall between the evildoer and God. God's not going to listen. It's plain. It's plain teaching in the scripture. How can I cry out with the expectation of God to respond to my cries if I have not responded to him in obedience and submitted my will to his? How do I expect God to hear me? That's not what the scriptures teach. But you know what? Sin is not always the problem. Those who have this feeling of unworthiness. You know what? These folks are trying to do their best that they can to serve God. There are some that have a feeling of unworthiness who are living the utmost spiritual and Christ-like life that they can possibly live. And I, I struggle to be critical of this spirit because there are some, I think, bright things in this kind of thinking. <laughs> When I was 10 years old and they used to ride horses to church and we didn't have any running water, I remember older brethren born before Kennedy that when we would have a prayer in this assembly, they would lay down on the ground, lay down on the floor. Now I'm talking about 300 people in an assembly. This isn't some four or five people up some holler somewhere. I'm talking about brethren who regarded God that much and approached his throne in that manner. That is the only way they could do it, with their face on the floor. There's something to say about approaching God that way and feeling unworthy to do it. And I couldn't have thought of anybody that lived a more godly life than the men that I remember that laid down on the floor and did it. Of course, all the others, uh, we're above that, I guess. 
But we're talking about posture and prayer, and I'm not going to go into that. Pharisee, remember that? Remember the sinner, the publican, the far off? What did he do? He stood up, didn't he? Most, he was standing up. I'm not talking about posture. I'm talking about humility. But I want you to notice Psalms chapter 8. Notice what he says, the psalmist, chapter 8. He says this, and, and I look at this, I just think that, that there are some that are possessed with a littleness that they need to have before God. Verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? Take thought of him, and the son of man, that you care for him. Here's a guy, that, that there's a spirit of somebody who thinks they're unworthy. To approach God. When somebody is in awe of God that much, there's the words of a man that feels humble before God. And he sees that. Why would God want to listen to me? When I see everything, why in the world would he want to even listen to me? I'm unworthy. Look what he says in verse 5. Yet, you have made him a little lower than God. You put a crown, him with the glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. What's he saying there? He's saying, I know how you feel. I recognize how you feel and that, that you think you're nothing. And we wonder why in the world God even cares about me. But listen, he does. He does. So while it is appropriate that we need to have our sense of littleness and humbleness before God and our sense of unworthiness, nonetheless, we need to appreciate the fact that God believes that you are special to him. And recognize that. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. You're special enough that he wants to know those things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. He wants you to pray without ceasing yet. I wonder if we've got to the core of the problem yet about why we struggle to pray, why we don't pray, why we fail to pray. Maybe sometimes our sense of unworthiness hinders us. But I tell you, there are other times when it does not hold us back at all. Your daughter-in-law calls. Your grandchild has a spot on the x-ray. It's very serious. It's going to get worse. They're going to take more tests. You think about your worthiness to God when that happens. No, sir. I'd really like to talk to God, but I don't know if I feel worthy enough. I'd really like to talk to God, but I don't know if I have time enough. I'd really like to talk to God about this, but I just don't know if I find the words. No. You haven't got to the core of the problem. Why we're struggling to pray. Whatever would inhibit you to pray, I'll tell you what, when things like that come up, they vanish away. We find a way to pray, don't we? We pray. Have we gotten to the, the core of the problem yet about praying yet? Have you figured it out? Why don't we pray? Why does it come so naturally at the moment of crisis? It seems so unnatural all the other times. And we make up all these excuses. Maybe it's this. Maybe at the heart of the struggle, is this. I don't need God. I don't need God. Now I was going to say that first, but I knew that you guys wouldn't believe me. Oh no, I need God. I need God in my life. I need God. Really? Let's think about that for a little bit. Why do we feel at those moments of crisis like a sick grandchild or an approaching storm or a loss of a job why do we feel those moments that we can pray and just kind of fear? We're afraid. And we can see and, and really rehearse every devastating possibility that will come out of those things. But there's something else. It is that we don't have any control over those things. Fear and lack of control. So our natural reaction is we need to pray to the one who is in control and does have that control. And so we pray. Now the problem is that most of us, most of us, don't live our lives in the middle of a crisis. We just don't. Most of us live every day without the fear of some devastating problem 
wiping out her house, wiping out her family. And we don't live in fear of things every day. Everything's beyond our control. We don't live like that. We just don't. For the most part, all of us, we live good lives. We've got great lives. You know what? Not one of us are wondering if we're going to eat after services. Not one of us. Every day of my entire life, I have never got up in the morning and wondered if I was going to eat. What am I going to eat? We're wrestling which restaurant to go to. How much stuff I got to pull out of that fridge right before I get what I want? And we're going to go to nice, comfortable homes tonight. And we're going to lay down in nice, comfortable beds. You need God? Listen, I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm saying that all those things that I just said is a blessing and truly a blessing. Truly a blessing, but those blessings can have their downside, and they do. They can leave us feeling self-made. Yes, sir. Independent. Self-made. I don't need God. And and really self-supplied, self-sufficient, and less dependent on God. That's what they do. Brethren, prayer will be a casualty of that arrogant mindset that I've seen in brethren. Prayer's the first casualty. You just don't need it. One of the essential elements of a meaningful prayer habit in your life is really and truly knowing in your heart how much you need God. I need thee. I need thee every hour. Oh, I need thee. I dare not take one step alone. Folks, that's the idea. That's the idea. We need him every day to nurture a relationship with him, to grow with him, to talk with him. And, and, And Jesus did it. He talked to his father. He developed that relationship in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, we're to be devoted to prayer. You, you can't have a relationship without it. We preach and teach that. But it's not just that simple. It's not, look, I'm going to have a prayer life. I'm going to develop this relationship with God every day because of prayer every day. We need to be talking to God because we need God every day. We need God. That's why we need to talk to Him. I need God every day because I'll tell you what, I go out there every day and there's the enemy out there every day. Let me ask you something. If there was a guy out there hunkered down behind that oak tree back there with a gun, waiting for you to come outside so he could kill you, shoot you, would you pray well before you left? If every morning you went to work, there was a guy stalking you with a shotgun in behind the courthouse, waiting for, would you pray? Would your prayer life improve a little bit if there was somebody after you? An enemy like that after you? Would you pray? 1 Peter chapter 5. He says this. Verse 8. Be sober. Spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, he's the enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour you and I get pursued every single day by the enemy that wants to devour, destroy, and kill you. You think you need to pray to God every day about that? And you know what? If you don't need to pray to God about yourself, you pray to your kids. You stick him on that yellow bus every day. You drop them off in front of that school every day. You know what's inside that bus? You know what's inside that building? I'm going to tell you something, folks. Satan wants your kids. He wants them. And he puts up friends with your kids that say and do things that you don't even want to know about. And they learn things in class and see things in the hallway that for most of us is unbelievable. He wants your kids. How often do you pray for your kids and you put them on that yellow bus? Once a month? Never? You need to pray for your kids. You need to pray for yourself every day because he's out there and he wants you. 
How about this? How about praying to God every day in our efforts to teach the lost? The walking dead are everywhere. Everywhere. Your friends, your family, your neighbors are lost without the gospel. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, go out there and make disciples. You need to do that. You think you need to pray to God for that strength to do that? There's a lot of work we need to do. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. Jesus promised that he'll be with you when you do that. When is the last time you asked God to give you the strength to say that first line, to somebody that you know, that you see every day, please give me the strength to say the first line that will break that barrier, that will start a conversation, that will lead to them coming to this place, that will lead them to the gospel. You know somebody did that for you? They did. And that that changed everything about your life. That changed your eternal destiny. God, give me the strength to do that. To say that, I know that I need to do, they're lost. You prayed to God for that kind of strength? Just to help me do that? How much should we be calling on him? The one who has promised to be with us and the one that promised to help us. How much? You know, think about this. You know, I need to pray every day because I'm making decisions every day. Every day. You know, we make decisions every day. Sometimes it just seems like they're everyday choices. How many among us have looked over their life in the past and think, man, I wish I had not have done that. I wish I hadn't decided that way. You know what? Things would be so much different if I'd have took this path instead of that path. And we make those decisions every day. And we think, you know what? It's not going to impact much. It's not going to be decisions you make are a huge impact and influence on everybody in your life and have far-reaching impact and influences on everybody's life that you know. And when it's like that, don't you think that every single day that the decisions that you make in your life, that you would pray to God for the help that, that you want and need and desire, that the decisions in your life will be right and that the things that you decide will make things right and help those around you every day. You know, the potential is there. The potential is there that can change lives in just the things that you don't think anything about. And we need to. I need God to be with me in those decisions, to guide me, to direct me, to help me. I need Him every hour. You know what? I fear that at the very core of our struggle to pray is that we have all lost that sense of just how much we do need Him. Psalms chapter 73, we'll close. He says this, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. We need to realize how much we need our rock and our refuge. And when we realize that, We humble ourselves. It's not going to be a problem. Prayer. If you're here tonight and never obeyed the gospel of Christ, we give you an opportunity to do that as we assemble. If you're outside the body of Christ, you're lost. If you're not in the Lord's church, you are lost. If you've not been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, you are lost. The Bible's very clear about that. Why don't you change that tonight? And then tonight, when you approach God in prayer, He'll hear every word that you say and direct and guide you. Please come. As together we stand and sing.